Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me uh, share with you a few thoughts about the future of work and, and new ways of working. As we, as we are exiting the pandemic, um, so much has changed in a way uh, over the last year um, that I wonder uh, what will happen as we are exiting uh, the pandemic. Will we fall back into some of the things we did before? Will bigger, uh, more prominent, uh, long-term changes uh, prevail and play a bigger role, perhaps? Just think about it, a year, a year and a half ago, everybody was talking about the environmental challenge, global warming, but also the hope that with, for example, electrical and autonomous driving vehicles, uh, we could tackle some of those challenges. But what does this mean? A year ago uh, in America, people were talking about uh, that uh, truck drivers, particularly long haul truck drivers, may be out of work. Their future of work may be grim. And in fact, when you think about truck drivers, this is the number one most populous job um, uh, in the in a majority of the states in the United States, uh, for example. So getting those people out of work really has an impact, not only on unemployment, but also on the livelihoods of these people. Will we be able to retrain them, reskill them, upskill them? Will they be willing to be upskilled? There is some thought and some surveys that show that only 10 to 15% that the people are, are willing to retrain and reskill. What will be the future of those that are displaced by the change in our technological capabilities and the way we do things? The future of work confronts us with a lot of challenges and a, a lot of opportunities as well. But the one thing that is certain is that there is going to be change. And yet, when we talk not just about the future of work, but when we talk about work more generally, the workplace, how we work, where we work, then oftentimes um, there's so much going on, it's really hard to, to keep track of things. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'd like to uh, focus not just on individual trees, so to speak, but really focus on the forest, on the big picture kind of view. And, and when we talk about workplace and what a workplace is, the biggest, most fundamental question, of course, we are, we are facing and we can ask ourselves is, why do we work together in physical locations in the first place? Why do we have a workplace that we go to in the morning and, and come home in the evening? Uh, the best-selling historian and author Yuval Harari wrote in his book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, he wrote in this book that the, the reason why humanity is so incredibly successful is our ability to interact socially with each other and through that interaction to coordinate with each other. So for Yuval Harari, the, the key magic ingredient to humanity's success is coordination. And where does coordination happen, particularly when we think about work? It happens in a physical location we call the workplace. So we could answer our questions, why do we work together in a physical location? We could answer it by saying, because that helps us coordinate with each other. That helps us to work together so that we can go far beyond what any individual could do. That's the way we built the pyramids and the Romans built the aqueducts. And, and in a factory, people are building machines and cars and airplanes. And in restaurants, uh, they are cooking a great piece of meal. But, but wait a minute, is that really true now at the end of a year plus in pandemic? You know what the pandemic taught us is that 
thanks to the technological tools that we have available to us today, we can actually work from home office and we can coordinate from home. It's mediated coordination through machines and, and, and technology and, and the internet, but it's coordination nevertheless. And so as many of us worked from home, we coordinated from home just nicely. Now, of course, that doesn't apply for, for all of us. In fact, there's a significant proportion of people that can't do home office very much. Those that, that, that sit in the cashier registers and supermarkets and those that are in the logistics chain delivering parcels and, and those that are in hospitals uh, and so on. All of those people, of course, can treat patients necessarily um, from home and they can't cook a meal from home and they, they can't, of course, build a car from home but many others can. And, and that applies not just to white collar people, uh, but, but to a, a, at the top of the pyramid, but to a wide spectrum uh, of folks in the workplace. So if, if we have realized then through the pandemic that we actually can survive pretty nicely uh, through working from home and coordinate with, each other quite successfully. Why do we need the workplace? Is, in other words, the pandemic telling us that there is the end of work as a physical place coming towards us, at least towards a significant portion of the working population? That's one way of looking at it. Um, but of course, that, that view hinges on our ability um, to uh, coordinate and our focus on coordination. Coordination, however, is not the only thing, perhaps not even the most important thing of humanity's success. In fact, we could look at it and we could say, maybe what makes humans so special is that we are capable of coming up with good decisions and making these good decisions. And, and when we look at the decision-making that we, we humans can do, we look at a capability that we have and we perform every day. Every day we face decisions and we take decisions. Uh, and that applies to senior managers as it applies to uh, the blue collar package delivery person. We all make decisions every single day. And as we decide, we can choose, do we go left or do we go right? And, and, and as we face these decisions, we can try to get better at it. In fact, that's what we have been doing for a long time. However, consultants and, and good self-help books aside, uh, people like Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky have shown over the last decades that, that improving human decision-making is really hard because we have all kinds of biases that, that make decision-making hard. And so some people think that decision-making can actually be automated, that eventually the machine can take over and make better decisions. In some ways, it's already happening. And in fact, if we hark back to autonomous driving cars, these cars make decisions about where to drive, how to overtake, when to brake. And so if these machines can drive pretty well and make good decisions, what is, what is, our, what is our contribution? What makes us special again? The, the interesting point here is that what makes us special isn't the sheer act of decision-making. It is how we prepare for the decision. So disconnect from the focus of 
decision-making, of choosing among two options. And, and think about how we prepare for a decision. And we best prepare for a good decision by seeing good options, by seeing a whole spectrum of choices, of alternatives that we can then evaluate with better options, better alternatives, we can make better decisions. And that is key, except better decisions and seeing those options for better decisions, seeing those options oftentimes is improved, greatly improved in fact, by working with each other, by engaging with each other, by being together. The truth is when we work together in a team in direct contact, for example, we see more and better options. And that makes us better decision makers. Now, here is a slight bonus track. We are, we are good at, good at making um, teams work, but we should first think individually for a little bit before we join a team and then hash it out in the team. That way we don't quickly in the team uh, agree on what the alpha animal in the team pushes for, but we have our own points of view. And then what the team comes up with usually is better. But there is no question that the team that working together elicits better option and that produces better decisions. So we could rephrase then our answer and say, we work together, we have a physical workplace because we have better decisions that we can make. And that is key, that's the key insight perhaps for the future. Now, we already see this unfold in a way in a other domain, in the domain of education, where it is called the flipped classroom concept. The idea is that you take the, the old metaphor of going to school to have knowledge downloaded on you and then go home and work out in homework, perhaps with your friends, uh, the, the, the questions that the teacher asks, that you flip this around, that you that you use the home to download knowledge to you, to acquire knowledge by watching videos and reading a book and so forth. And then you go to school because school is the social place for learning. So you, you work at home and acquire the knowledge, but then you come together to learn from each other in this social context of learning. That's the flipped classroom concept. Now, I believe that we have not only the flipped classroom to look at, but we now in the post-pandemic world have the flipped workplace to look at. The flipped workplace means nothing less than that we can do a lot of the actual work at home, but when we really need each other to come up with better options and therefore better decisions, we come together. Uh, in a workplace that is the social place for discussing and eliciting better options. But how should we imagine such a flipped workplace? What is the, the key ingredient of it? It's really hard, it's difficult, much as it is difficult to imagine the flipped classroom. In fact, some time ago, I, I was the juror of a, a competition of young architectural students who were tasked with designing the school of the future. And when I looked at their presentations, they all had um, a, a map room where to store maps. They all had a library, a school library where to store books. And they all had a computer room where people would go to work with desktop computers. And I said to them, when, when did you last go to a physical library? And many of them said, not for years because I have ebook readers and I download it on the inter from the internet. And when I said, uh, what about maps? When did you look last at a physical map? They said, 
not for years because I use Google Maps. And when I said, when did you last go together as a group to a physical room to sit in front of desktop computers? They looked at me and they shook their head and they said, but we have tablets and laptops and smartphones. And so I said, but why do you design then schools that still have those physical places, physical places of knowledge downward rather than physical places of social learning? And, and these architects, when they came up with those blueprints, they didn't have this kind of imagination of what a flipped classroom could look like. And so when we think about the flipped workplace, we need to think about the imagination that's necessary, the mindset. What is the kind of workplace that we need, the structure, the physical structure, but also the organizational structure? the processes, the mechanisms in place so that we can engage with each other to elicit better options for better decisions. What it requires is nothing short of a real different mindset, a mindset not steeped in the 19th century, but in the 21st. It's an agile mindset that we need where the mind is agile and flexible and adaptable enough in order to imagine a world that isn't designed by the past, but a world that is designed to look into the future. A workplace, for example, in which there is lots of opportunities to bump into each other, to engage with each other in different configurations so that we can work together, learn from each other in a far positive, far more positive environment. It's going to be incredibly thrilling and challenging but it's going to be also a huge opportunity for us. That is an opportunity that the pandemic brought forward and that I think we are well advised to take to heart. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for joining me on this mental road trip. Bye-bye.